So hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, on this short presentation to introduce the Huguen AUV system to you all. My name is Richard Mills and I'm the Vice President of Sales for Marine Robotics with Kongsberg Maritime. I've been with the company for about eight and a half years and I've been in the AUV industry for some 13 or 14 years. What we're going to do is spend maybe 25 minutes or so showing you a new vehicle, the Huguen Endurance. And it's a bit of an evolution for us on what we've done before. And the clue's kind of in the name. It's all about endurance. It's all about extra range. So the presentation, I'll be uh, talking for the next few minutes. There is a Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar tool that we have here. So if you've got any questions, please use that to type your questions in. We'll try and answer as many as we can at the end. If we don't get round to them, then rest assured, we'll uh, log them all and contact you with an answer uh, shortly afterwards. There will also be a short survey after the, uh, the presentation, and we'd be obliged if you could fill that in and give us some feedback, because we always like to try and get better at these things as we move forward. So without further ado, let's have a look at the Huguen AUV system then, and the Huguen Endurance, the newest version of it. And we can't really talk about the Huguen without going back to the beginnings. So the Huguen AUV program started in Kongsberg more than 25 years ago now, and in fact, its first dive was on the 7th of May in 1993. And you can see from the shape here on the screen that it's changed quite a lot in that period. So it began as a program between Kongsberg, Statoil, now called Equinor, the national oil company in Norway, uh, the Navy in Norway, and also FFI, the Defence Research Establishment. So they began as a development partner and have continued as such with us over the last 25 years as our journey has, has moved forwards. And it's a very valuable and productive relationship with them. As we look at the Huguen development and the story behind it, it really is one of people. So on the picture on the left hand side, that's the very first Huguen just before the very first dive. And in fact, there are two people on that photograph who are still involved in the program to this day. The gentleman on the left of the image wearing the blue jacket is Odd Arold Pedersen, and Odd Arold was our operations manager. He began with FFI, came to Kongsberg for about 20, 20 odd years, and a few years ago went back to FFI, where he still works on Huguen related developments. The gentleman in the middle of the picture with his back to us wearing the green shirt is Atla Gran, and those that know my sales team will know that that's uh, Atla, and he covers Europe and the Nordic region. So he was a field technician with HIPAPS at the time and became involved with the AUV program. He's been working in sales now for the last five or six years. We like to collaborate with our customers and when we deliver a vehicle to them, that's not the end of the story. We like to work with them to make sure the vehicle is optimized. That happens before delivery and post delivery, whether that's reconfiguring payload or adding new capability uh, or midlife upgrades. You know, the longevity of these vehicles is, uh, is quite phenomenal. We have some AUVs out there now that are well into their teens in age. Obviously, we can't talk about Huguen without doing a little bit of bragging. And uh, we view Huguen as the most successful commercial AUV out there. It's probably done more line kilometers of survey than any other vehicle. Uh, especially in the deep water AUV survey market. So it's been very, very successful. And then of course, the evolution part of it, it continues to change, continues to evolve, continues to develop, whether that's energy batteries, whether that's new sonars, new, new optical sensors or new autonomous behaviors. We're always developing new capabilities. Now our vehicles are used around the world globally in all sorts of different applications, whether that's the geophysical world for the commercial survey industry or pipeline survey and inspection, whether that's scientific use. For example, Anna Valin and her team at the University of Gothenburg have uh, surveyed underneath the uh, ice shelves in Antarctica using a Huguen AUV a couple of times, uh, whether it's governmental hydrographic survey or search and recovery work, or indeed defense for mine countermeasures and uh, intelligent preparation of the environment or rapid environmental uh, assessment. This presentation is gonna focus really on the commercial end of that segment. And there is gonna be a defense webinar on the 25th of February. In fact, there'll be two, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, much like today, where we'll focus on the defense related applications. So without further ado, let's have a look at the vehicle. And the first thing that you can see is it's probably a bit bigger than the other vehicles that you're familiar with. 
So on the screen, we've got three, three systems there. The first one is a Huguenot UV rated to 3,000 meters. That's got a 75 centimeter outside diameter. It's about 5.2 meters long, weighs about 1,000 kilograms. And depending on the payload configuration, the endurance is somewhere between kind of 24 and 30 hours. The second vehicle, the one in the middle, is Huguen Superior. That's the one we launched a couple of years ago. So that's a little bit bigger than the standard Huguen. It's an 87 and a half centimeter outside diameter. It's about six and a half meters long, weighs about 2000 kilograms, and it's got much longer endurance. So we're talking somewhere between kind of 50 and 60 hours uh, with the existing batteries. And we've got some new batteries that we'll be delivering for the first time in a, a short while that boost that up to somewhere around the kind of 70 to 80 to 85 hour range. And finally, the vehicle at the back, the one we're here to talk about, Hugen Endurance, you can see it's actually considerably bigger. So it's a 1.2 meter diameter vehicle and it's 10 meters long, weighs some 6,000 kilograms. Obviously, some of that will change because it's a pickup truck. It really is designed to carry a variety of payload that can be uh, fully integrated or indeed an empty payload section provided with the vehicle. What we're going to do today is I'm going to show you a configuration that's based on the payload capabilities of the Huguen Superior. So it's got the same sensor package that we would put on one of those vehicles. And in that configuration, that can do about 15 day long missions. So it can run for some 2,200 kilometers or so. So in real world terms, what does that mean? Well, if you're in Egypt at Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast, you could sail all the way to Venice without a break. If you're in Sydney, in Australia, you could sail all the way to Auckland in New Zealand without a break. You could survey up to something like 1,100 square kilometers in a single dive using that payload. Obviously, the final endurance and the area coverage rate is dependent on speed and also how much you use those sensors. So let's have a look at the vehicle in a little bit more detail. And the first thing you'll notice is kind of looks like a Huguen. It's because it is, it's an, it really is an evolution of the system that we've had around for some time now. So in the front end, there's a titanium sphere that holds all the payload electronics, the PP sphere, the payload processor sphere. In the back end, in, uh, towards the, the, the tail section, there's another titanium sphere that holds all the control processor electronics. That has the IMU in the bottom of it and a DVL sticking out of the very bottom. So in the back, it's really is where I'm going and in the front, it's what I'm doing. And then all of the payload sensors are added around the vehicle. In this particular picture, the mast is stowed because uh, that's how it would look when it's in its cruising mode. And of course, it has the usual payload in this configuration. So the dual receiver synthetic aperture sonar, it's got an EM2040, but a little bit different from the one that's on the superior. Sub bottom profiler, camera, methane sensor, all of those things. Now, if we have a look at the oblique angle here, you can see a couple of the features that are instantaneously different. They're pretty obvious. And starting at the front, the forward looking sonar. So in this case, instead of just having the vertical view that we get with the standard Huguen AUV and the Huguen Superior, we're introducing a horizontal view as well. So not only can it be used for collision avoidance and contour smoothing, terrain following, it can also assist with situational awareness underwater and help it turn left and right accordingly, particularly when it's working in high slope environments. You can see there there's some inlets for cooling and for the environmental sensors. So they provide a water flow over the spheres. There's one four for the, uh, at the front for the payload sphere and one at the aft for the control processor sphere. And they help stabilize some of the temperature there because there's a lot of electronics in them. They also provide the water flow for the environmental sensors. So some of the membrane sensors that we have on the vehicle. The next thing you'll notice that's different from the previous Huggins we've released are the forward stabilizer fins. And this is a big vehicle. So when you're operating very close to the sea floor, if you simply actuate the rudder, the fins at the back of the vehicle to climb away from the sea floor, the first thing that will happen is the tail will drop. And when you're operating at three, four, five, six meters off the sea floor, that's probably not optimum. So we've introduced the forward stabilizer fins to allow the vehicle to climb in a level attitude away from the sea floor. So it'll climb in the heave axis. They also provide some roll stability, which aid with the long range acoustic sensors and help produce some very, very nice quality data. 
The next thing you'll see then on the top is the mast. So this is some one and a half meters tall. And on the top of it, it's got a few things that you might be familiar with. So it has the standard short range RF. It has Wi-Fi for short range communications. It has the GNSS receivers, two of them. And in this particular case, we've added something else for surface situational awareness. So it has some cameras and it has AIS. So when it's on the surface, it looks around and makes sure it's operating in a safe environment. Now at the side, we've got these slow speed maneuvering fins, one on either side, and they, they fold out when the vehicle's operating in slow speed environments. So we're not saying the vehicle will hover, but we are saying the vehicle will operate quite comfortably at sub one knot speeds. So it'll be able to maintain station in a low power loitering mode. And then at the back end, I'll show you a little bit more later on, we have a brand new tail design. So on the underside of the vehicle, I said that the EM2040 is a little, little bit different on this, and it is. So we've fitted before to a standard Hugin, a dual receiver EM2040. We've optimized that design for this particular vehicle capability. So the dual receiver EM2040, the Mark II version, will give you about 10 times water depth in swath coverage. So what we see in practice is that somewhere kind of the eight, eight and a half, nine times water depth. So if you fly at 40 meters, then we can expect something like 320 to 360 meters swath coverage in pure bathymetry. On this configuration, we've included the dual receiver HiSAS synthetic aperture sonar, and that will see, of course, up to 500 meters either side, depending on geometry and speed. And that provides both imagery and bathymetry. And of course, then there's the usual sensors on the underside of the vehicle. That includes the LEDs for the camera and the laser panel, and also the sub-bottom profilers. So that's the, the, a bit on the payload. And then the back end, you'll see some novel developments here. The first thing is the dual propeller. So we have two propellers and they're contra-rotating. So this provides us with some extra capabilities and also some energy saving that we've never had before. So from an energy saving perspective, it's a little more efficient but also it takes out the torque rotation of a single propeller. So previously with a propeller turning clockwise, the vehicle would always want to swim left wing low. It would want to turn against the propeller. And we've taken that out using the fins at the back. That consumes energy. That goes away with a contra-rotating propeller because there is no anti-torque rotation. The other thing that they provide is high speed. So this vehicle, whilst bigger and heavier, will actually travel faster. So its speed range is down from about one knot up to about eight knots. So it's a little bit quicker. And then finally, they provide some redundancy. So there's two propellers on a single shaft with two motors. So we can shut one off, or if one should fail in a mission, you've still got 10 days left, it could still perform its task. And then we've got the swept fins. So the fins at the back, the control planes at the back are bigger than before for effectiveness. And they have to be because of the size and the weight of the vehicle. But they're also swept, they're more streamlined and they reduce drag, they're more efficient and they provide a little bit of protection for the, uh, those propellers on the aft of the vehicle. So that's the vehicle configuration. And the, the version I'm gonna to speak to you today about is really, as I said previously, configured like a Huguen Superior. So it has the same payload, the synthetic aperture sonar, the EM2040, sub bottom profile, a camera, laser, CTD, methane, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, and all of those things that we normally carry along with a magnetometer. Also can be equipped with all of the same capabilities as a Huguen Superior, whether that's the advanced navigation, the terrain navigation, the auto automatic pipeline detection and tracking, all of those software capabilities are still available on the Huguen Endurance. And in fact, we rely on some of them to get the performance required for that 15 day mission. And within the 15 day mission, there's also a bit of change to, to the software on board. Uh, because when we send a vehicle out at the moment, let's say it's a one or a two day mission and something goes wrong, sometimes we decide actually we're better off getting the vehicle back immediately and it will command an emergency ascent. Now, when you're on a 15 day mission and you're operating shore to shore without a support vessel, then that's probably not the best thing to do. So we've planned in some redundancy to the fault management system on board the vehicle, that it allows it to shut things off, it allows it a more advanced response, and it allows it to come home safely, and hopefully complete a lot of the mission on the way. So let's have a look at one of the key enabling capabilities on this vehicle. 
Because if you're going to put a vehicle out unsupervised for 15 days, you're going to really want to know where it is. So we've got the advanced navigation provided by the Sunstone facility. Now, Sunstone is our own inertial navigation system. We take the raw inputs from all of the sensors that we have on board the vehicle, including the new CTEX NGCR5. That's a very high grade IMU. It's available as an INS, but we take the raw data from that, couple it with a DVL, a depth sensor, and all of the other things that we have on board. And we combine that into our own in situ position state estimation. We've done a recent dive towards the end of last year that was 50 hours long using this system, fully unsupervised, absolutely zero interaction with the vehicle over about 250 kilometers. And we demonstrated a performance, this was delivery to a customer, better than 0.005% of distance traveled in a straight line over a flat bottom. Now, of course, if you're operating in an environment where you've got a DTM, a digital terrain model, or even features that you know are positioned absolutely, then we can also include them and use them as a local reference. And in fact, for a wind farm survey, if you know the position of those turbines, let's put them in, into our system so that we can use them. To give you an idea of what it really means as a real world example, we're gonna build an example mission coming out of Wick in Scotland. So let's say we have to get there. We have to transit there autonomously from Stavanger. That's about 500 kilometers. So a standard Huygens got performance of about 0.08% of distance traveled in a straight line. So at the end of that mission, that means it's got in a long track error somewhere in the region of 400 to 500 meters. With the latest navigation system, that comes right down to 25 to 50 meter certainty. It really is that accurate. So that enables us to do shore to shore operations. Now, of course, if we're operating like this, if we're taking the vehicle out from the dock, we're gonna need a pretty large crane to put it in the water when it weighs 6,000 kilograms. But the vehicle can still be operated from a ship. Let's say, for example, you're doing mineral surveys in the mid Pacific. It's not going to swim from San Diego. It doesn't quite have that range just yet. However, you can operate it from a ship and launch and recover it using something like the boat transfer system from our colleagues at Deck Machinery in Kongsberg at Ollesund on the west coast of Norway. So that, that's a semi-permanent installation that a lot of larger vessels have, and it's a cradle-based arrangement that goes either up and down the side or the stern of the vessel to safe, safely launch and recover crew vessels. And in this particular case, it could be modified to carry a Hugen Superior or a Hugen Endurance. When we're operating from shore and we're coming in and out of dock, there might be some local rules and legislation that require you to supervise it or, or monitor it as it goes out of the dock, out of the, the harbour, using a small chase boat. But once it's off, once it's off and running on its mission, it is designed to be fully autonomous. And that means that you can reduce the carbon footprint significantly of any survey campaign. If you are operating it from a ship in somewhere like the mid-Pacific, then actually that enables you to do concurrent activity, generate revenue doing something else, or do uh, core samples or ROV work that you can't necessarily do with an AUV. So that it provides the opportunity to actually enhance the, uh, the revenue of ship-based operations, but also to run shore to shore in a fully unsupervised manner. So let's have a little look at an example survey. And we're gonna focus on this area off the coast of Wick. So Wick's a small village, small town on the coast of Scotland. And just offshore there, some 12 or 13 kilometers is the Beatrice Wind Farm. It's currently Scotland's largest, I think, with 84 turbines. And there are four expansion areas that have been proposed. And it's only in 45 meters of water, so it's not massively deep. Can you really use a big vehicle in that environment? Well, we say, yes, you can. And this is how we would propose to do it. So we do a shore to shore mission, launch from the dock and let it go. It would transit out to the, uh, the survey site and then conduct a lawnmower pattern survey and return to base at the end of it. Sounds relatively straightforward, but there's some things in there that we can consider for the performance. If we have a look at the speed of the vehicle, yes, it can go up to eight knots, but we'd actually try to do this survey at something akin to a normal AUV survey, let's say 1.8 meters a second, three and three quarter knots. That's about the average speed a Hugin will work at. It'd fly at something like 30 meter altitude. So it's um, well above any risk of collision with the sea floor. It's 
make sure the geometry is good for the synthetic aperture sonar and the bathymetry, but it's also well below any wave action and interference from the weather. That would enable us a 380 meter track spacing and a 500 meter total swath on each of those legs, giving us about a 30% overlap. We can survey that area in just under, just under nine days using a Hugin Endurance, and that includes the shore-to-shore -shore transit. Now we've done some analysis and we've compared this to one of our own surface-mounted multi-beams, an EM2040C, on a surface ship. We estimate that we can cover that area in about nine days, and it would take a surface vessel with an EM2040C something like 14 or 15 days to provide the same coverage, so we are more efficient. Not only that though, but we also provide a lot of extra data because not only do you get the bathymetry that you'd be getting from that EM2040C, you also then get the synthetic aperture sonar imagery. We get the sub bottom profiler. We've got all of the environmental sensors and the oceanographic sensors on board. And we get a magnetometry survey of the entire area, pretty much for free while we're out there doing it. So this vehicle would be operated potentially from a remote operations center. That could be a container on the dock side with an internet connection. It could be operated in Scotland from Norway or Houston or Australia. It really matters not with cloud connectivity. So the mission plan would be sent from here to the vehicle prior to launch and then off it would go. But that's not necessarily the last time you'd hear from the vehicle in that survey. So that's at least nine days. Let's say, for example, you wanted to get some data periodically throughout that journey. Well, once a day, it could surface. It's only in 45 meters of water, so it's not too arduous for the vehicle to pop to the surface and offload data using NVR. Of course, in that, you could also get a position update from GPS. So the maritime broadband radio has got a range from the vehicle to shore of something like 20 odd kilometers. It's got sufficient uh, bandwidth to actually offload data in packets. It might take a little time, might take an hour, but that's okay. And we can get a full day's worth of survey data then off the vehicle. That can then be processed and through cloud services like Cognify or third party uh, cloud based uh, services that could be processed anywhere in the world. And it's great for near real time QC. So if you're quality checking the data to make sure there are no holes, no holidays, that everything is working, everything is right, what can you then do about it afterwards? Well, you could send that information back to the vehicle uh, to reprogram it. And of course, to do that QC checking, we might use a program like Reflection, that's our in-house post-mission analysis tool. And that visualizes all of the data, overlays all of the data in one simple system. And here you've got two screens that show the mission view. Uh, the picture on the bottom right there shows some SAS imagery, it's, so it shows some bathymetry, it shows some camera images overlaid on top of it. And we can, uh, we can do that quite easily on a local machine, on a network, or even in a cloud-based service. Target view will show you some individual objects of interest, and they can then be used to influence how the mission evolves. And you can send that mission back to the vehicle, either via MBR or via a satellite link when it comes to the surface. So that's how the vehicle kind of works and how it could work in a long range survey. Just because it's going off for 15 days doesn't mean you can't supervise it, but it does enable you to do this without a surface ship. And of course, now we can't tell you about Hugin and we can't talk about the AUV without talking about the important stuff because it really is all about the data. And I've got a couple of pretty pictures here. So this one is HiSAS 1032 dual receiver bathymetry collected in Horton back in December. Some of you may recognize the object sticking up out of the seafloor. It's a certain U-boat that um, is embedded in the seafloor just outside of where we, uh, where we work. Um, in fact, it's been on the cover of sea technology a couple of times in the past. So this is uh, just a little snapshot of the HiSAS Bathy. And then, of course, we've got the pure bathymetry from EM2040. What's really nice about this image is this is actually many, many passes all merged together, but actually without any extra processing. It shows the accuracy and the robustness and repeatability of the navigation solution that we now have on board the vehicle. And then finally, I can't talk about synthetic aperture sonar without giving you a picture, just to remind you how good it is. With two by two centimeter resolution close in and 12 and a half centimeter resolution at 500 meter ranges on the dual RX version. What does that really mean? Well, it means at 12 and a half centimeters at 500 meters range, that 
I can get my vehicle out into the ocean to detect something as small as your mobile phone at 500 meters. So that concludes the, uh, the presentation. Uh, we'll happily take any questions now. Um, I've taken about 25 minutes, which is perfect. We've got a couple of, uh, a couple of questions going on. Uh, the first one is, hello, lots of CAD models. And that's a fair point, lots of CAD models. When are you gonna have one in the water? Well, one vehicle is under development at the moment. We're not quite ready to tell you when it's in the water, but as soon as it is, you will be the first people to know. Uh, Yaroslav has asked what type of battery is being used. Well, in this configuration, it's a lithium ion. It's a pressure compensated lithium ion battery that we've had under development for about four years. But there may be alternative uh, fuel arrangements or energy arrangements in the future to take us further than those 15 days. Arthur's asked, what's the total data storage capacity on the AUV? Enough for 15 days mission, or is it mandatory to come up and send data? In, uh, in this case, what is the time needed to transmit the data? Well, there is sufficient solid state storage on board the vehicle for the entire mission. Uh, and we've followed the same kind of theory that we've had with the Hugen and the Hugen Superior over, over the last couple of years. So on board the vehicle, there's a 10 gigabit ethernet network to actually get the data to the storage device. And then there's a 10 gigabit network connection to get it off. So when you get the vehicle back, there's a simple cover on the starboard side by the nose that you take off. There's two clips and one connector. You unplug the NAS bottle and you walk into your op center and you plug it straight in and start downloading the data by a 10 gigabit connection there as well. That's the easiest way to do it. Of course, you can transmit it all via NBR, and the, the time it will take will depend massively on the type of data that you're transmitting, whether it's all of the data or whether it's the in-mission process data. So of course, with the SAS, we process it in mission, so you don't need to send the, the high volumes, the raw stave data, and you'd only send the process data over the, uh, over the, the broadband radio. And from memory, that's um, up to something like uh, 16 or 17 megabits a second. I'm not an MBR specialist, so I'll plead the fifth on that one, uh, but the data is available on our website. Or if you'd like to know more, let me know and we will message you. Uh, we've got a question from Justin who asks, is the vehicle able to fly over the entire depth range or must it be ballasted heavy to get deep and release ballast to resurface? That's an interesting question because there are always different ways of doing this. And some manufacturers and some organizations actually do have descent weights. Some manufacturers will ballast their vehicles light and drive it down. And some manufacturers will ballast their vehicle heavy and drive it up. We kind of like to keep everything neutral. So when the vehicle goes in the water, it will be neutrally buoyant and we drive it down and then it will maintain its altitude through driving through the propeller and the rudders at the back and the forward fins. Uh, but it will keep its altitude predominantly through that neutral buoyancy. That means that should something go wrong in the worst case environment, and this is the same for all of our vehicles, we simply drop an emergency weight and it will come to the surface. Uh, a really good question from Donizetti on what's the recharge time for the batteries? So this is a lot of energy that we're putting in these vehicles, so that's a valid question. Um, I had a question the other day asking, can we swap the batteries? Hmm. They're pretty big for that, so really it's not optimized for swapping batteries between dives. It would probably take you just as long to do that than it would to charge them. But the charge time for this amount of, uh, of batteries would be determined by how much uh, energy you can actually source, what the current of your charging capability is. Uh, we estimate at the moment that charging that volume of batteries is going to take somewhere between eight and 12 hours, depending on the charges you have available. Rich has asked, typically the EM2040 is used as a gap filler for the high cess Is there an advantage to using the dual receiver EM2040 beyond being a gap filler? And there are advantages to using the uh, EM2040 dual RX. One of those, of course, is you get pure bath bathymetry from it, which some surveyors prefer. The second element though, is we can get water column data across that entire swath. So if you're looking something in the water or you're doing perhaps leak or seep detection, detecting bubbles in the water column of the bathymetry of the EM2040 data is perhaps one of the best ways that you're going to do it. And of course, now we'll have that over that massive swath. Somebody anonymous has asked, will they be purchasable or run as a surface service? If they're purchasable, how much will they cost? A couple of good questions there because this is business model stuff. 
you can imagine that they're not going to be inexpensive. I'm not going to sit here and tell you exactly how much they are because that really does depend on the configuration. If you'd like to have a serious conversation, then drop me a line and we'll enter an NDA and we'll talk about it. Uh, Abbas has asked, uh, can you talk about launch and recovery from a ship at sea? Well, I mentioned that earlier on with the boat transfer system. Uh, if you have a look at our, our website and put in BTS or boat transfer system or Google Kongsberg BTS, it should come up quite well. Uh, if you need, drop me a line and we'll send you some details on. Uh, Ian's asked, when transiting to the work site, would the vehicle travel on the sea surface or underwater? Well, it would travel underwater. They're optimized for operation relatively close to the sea floor, probably somewhere in the, the 40 to 100 meter altitude range. Uh, when it gets to what it, the area where it needs to work, then it can descend to low altitude, working down as, even as closely as some four or five meters if it's doing optical work with the camera and laser. Yaroslav has asked, what's the maximum diving depth? Well, we've kept what we've done with the Hugin Superior before. So this is a 6,000 meter rated vehicle. So everything on it will allow you to go to almost full ocean depth. Ryan's asked, have you made any advancements in true autonomy for this vehicle? And that's a really, really good question because some people confuse autonomy and what it actually means. So on the vehicle, we have a couple of different types of autonomy. We have what we call navigation autonomy, getting from A to B. So that means following a route plan. That's pretty straightforward deterministic autonomy. We then have a condition-based hierarchical infrastructure architecture on board the vehicle that says, if this, then that. So if I detect this, I do that based on certain safety protocols. And this is the same for all of our vehicles. So for example, I reach a waypoint, I turn a corner provided it's safe for me to do so. I come to the next leg of my mission, I check my battery, I continue, provided it's safe to do so. That's how the condition-based hierarchical approach works. What we have on board this vehicle is a, a little bit advanced from that because we have the capability to add in, and we have this on some of our other vehicles, some uh, adaptive autonomy. And perhaps the most, the, the simplest version of that is either the forward-looking sonar or the a pipe tracker. So they detect something and the vehicle reacts to it in real time. The pipe tracker detects a pipe and then it follows it. It becomes the primary reference for navigation. The forward-looking sonar detects contours and adjusts the attitude and the altitude of the vehicle accordingly. It detects objects in front of the vehicle and might turn the vehicle around to try and climb over it or go back safely down the route that it's coming on. So that's adaptive autonomy. We've also changed some of the autonomy for the long-range mission with performance in mind, um, the ability to change the mission based on what's happening around the vehicle is something we're very aware of. Uh, and we're working on the capability, it's not there yet, but we're working on the capability to not only measure how much coverage we're getting with our sensors, but then automatically adjust the track spacing accordingly. That's one of the things we'd like to introduce in the future. Hans has asked, how slow can the vehicle maneuver with the, the low speed thrusters? Well, it's going to be sub one knot, somewhere around the half a knot uh, region should be comfortable. Less than that, we're not willing to guarantee, but we'll trial it and come back and let you know. Uh, Matt Kingsland, hi Matt, how are you? The, he's asked, what sort of altitude would you run such large vehicles when doing camera sensors? I think I've just covered that one. We'd still work down pretty close, five meters or so. You know, optical sensors were limited by turbidity in the range of the, uh, the LEDs. Some of the camera manufacturers will claim we can do seven or eight or nine meters, and in some water conditions we can, uh, but in others we can't. And as we all know, with optical sensors, sometimes you can't see anything no matter the altitude. Uh, Fred's asked, how long does it take from PO to final delivery? Well, if you'd like to have an answer to that question, Fred, give me a call. We'll have a chat. Um, is it longer or shorter than the other models? Well, it's a little bit longer. Uh, and are there plans to discontinue the previous models? Not at all. The Hugin, the Hugin Superior and the Hugin Endurance are part of the same Hugin family. They continue to be available. They continue to be developed and evolve, and there may be new members of the Hugin family come in the future. Somebody autonomous has asked, or anonymous, sorry, has asked, what's the payload capacity? Well, it really is a pickup truck. So anything that you imagine that you can fit on the outside or inside that huge vehicle, we can probably fit. There's a lot of power available. Obviously, that has an impact on the endurance if we put something super power hungry on there. Uh, Elkin has asked, how sensitive is the forward-looking sonar on the vehicle? Would it identify a fishing net? 
Now that's a question we get asked quite regularly. Um, the detection of water in trained fishing nets is inherently difficult. Any sonar manufacturer worth their salt would tell you it's impossible to guarantee that we could detect a, a fishing net subsurface. We might be able to see it, but it really does depend on the thickness of the net. It depends on how long it's been submerged. It depends on the material it's been made of. The forward-looking sonar is uh, pretty high resolution. Uh, it's good enough to see mooring lines and, uh, and some ropes and things like that. But I'm not going to sit here and guarantee that it can avoid every fishing net that's in the ocean. Uh, we've had a lot more questions uh, here. We've run over by a couple of minutes. If everybody's happy, I'll continue answering them as best I can, maybe for the next uh, four, four or five minutes or so. Fred's asked, what's the expected lifetime for this new vehicle, assuming about 120 days utilization, utilization a year? Is it realistic to assume 10 years? Well, Fred, we've got Huguenot EUVs still in service that are 15 years old, still out there today. There's no reason to think this will be any different. Uh, Patrick's asked, would you have pressure tolerant battery option? It is a pressure tolerant battery in the vehicle. That's what we've, uh, we've planned. All of our Huguenot vehicles have uh, pressure tolerant, pressure compensated lithium polymer batteries. Uh, Shane's asked, what would an emergency ascent situation look like if the endurance is a long distance from shore, maybe days? Well, in that case, uh, Shane, what we'd hope to do, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is we'd hope to actually cut that off before we get there. So we make sure that we don't get to a position where an emergency scent is, a, is avoidable, is unavoidable. So we'd like to make sure that our safety hierarchy is such that we come back on a reduced performance ca uh, capability rather than end up floating on the surface some eight days from shore. And I, I think at that point, we've got uh, a couple of more questions that we'll note, if you don't mind, and we'll come back to everybody via email for those because we're now seven minutes over time. Um, I hope everybody has found this useful, found it helpful. Uh, the questions have certainly been coming thick and fast. I hope I've answered them sufficiently well enough. If not, please drop me a line and we'll continue to, to answer them beyond. Uh, if you have any questions, my email is on the screen or get in touch with either Arn Helder in the Americas, uh, with Atle or Dave in Europe or in Asia with Martin Gutowski in the Singapore office. We'll be happy to help. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.